This week we are looking at chapter 26, and that is on population ecology. When we say population ecology, it probably brings up memories of a few years ago when the news hit the front headlines that the Earth had finally reached a population of 7 billion people. As population ecologists, there's a lot of things to wonder and worry about, knowing that there's that many people on Earth, and that will be one of our topics during this chapter. However, at the start of the book, of this chapter, we have a story that's kind of interesting called A Honking Mess, the uh, story of Canada geese, which we're all familiar with. One thing you may not have known is that they were hunted to near extinction in the late 1800s. And in the early 1900s, federal laws and international treaties were put in place to protect them and other migratory birds. In recent decades, the number of geese in the U.S. has actually soared, so it looks like their numbers have completely recovered. For example, Michigan had about 9,000 birds in 1970 and today has more than 300,000. We can see these plant-eating birds congregating in a lot of public places these days like golf courses, parks, around lakes and ponds. I know uh, at the school in Albert Lee we have a pond that has a population of Canada geese as well. Now, today, they're actually considered pests and nuisances because they produce the slimy green feces that people tend to step on or get on their clothing. And it also gets into the water and contributes to the algal bloom because of the nutrients that are in their feces. Also, Canada geese pose a hazard to air traffic such as happened in 2009 when some geese went through some engines of U.S. Airways uh, plane and caused the plane to make an emergency landing. Luckily, all 155 people aboard survived and were just fine. However, that does pose a large problem for air traffic. Controlling the number of geese poses a challenge because several different Canada geese populations actually spend the time in, in the U United States. Remember a population is a group of organisms that have the ability to interbreed with one, in, one another. In the past, nearly all Canada geese seen in the U.S. were migratory. However, today, though most still migrate, there are some populations that don't migrate anymore. Canada geese breed where they're raised and then the non-migratory birds are generally descendants of geese deliberately introduced to a park or to a hunting preserve or such. During the winter the migratory birds often mingle with the non-migratory ones and it's hard to tell them apart. Um, Life is more difficult for the migratory ones because of the energy spent migrating. The ones that do not migrate have more energy to spend on reproduction. In 2006, increasing complaints about Canada geese led the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to encourage wildlife managers to look for ways to reduce the non-migratory Canada goose populations without harming the migratory birds. So to do so, those biologists will need to know which traits characterize each goose population, as well as how the populations interact with one another and with other species and with their physical environment. That sort of information is the focus of the field of population ecology, one of the, the many problems faced population ecology. Here's a nice picture of what it might look like in a problem area with Canada geese.
Population demographics. Ecological factors affect the size, the density, that's how compacted a population is, the distribution, that's where they're located, and the age structure of a population. Studying a population ecology often involves the use of demographics, which is statistics that describe a population. Understanding the demographics help us to s understand the population itself. Biologists often have to use sampling techniques to estimate the actual population size or how many individuals are in that population. One of those me methods is plot sampling. It estimates the total number of individuals in an area based on direct counts in a small portion of that area. So rather than counting the whole population, they count a small area and then estimate the total amount. These estimates are most accurate when the organisms counted are not very mobile and conditions across the area they occupy are more or less uniform. Again, the population size is the total number of individuals in a population. And plot sampling is a method to estimate the population size of organisms that do not move much by taking counts in smaller plots and then extrapolating from that number for what the population would be in the whole area. Another method that I've used before and found useful is called mark and recapture sampling. For instance, how they estimate the population size of mobile animals like the Florida key deer. I've done it for mice in a woodland area. Uh, what you basically do is have a capture time and you set traps or do observations depending on the organism you're looking at and you capture them and then you mark them in some way that usually doesn't harm them and then you release them back into the wild and then you you go back to the same area and you do it all over again and you check the proportion of marks among the individuals that you recapture and do a little mathematical equation and you can figure out what the, the total population would be. Population density is the number of individuals per unit area or volume, such as the number of dandelions per square meter of lawn. It, population distribution describes how they're distributed, such as our three main ways of population distribution, clumped, uniform, or random. clump looks like this, like a wolf pack clumped in an area. Random has no set pattern, like these dandelions randomly scattered over this lawn. Near uniform, often because of the territoriality of the individuals, that they, they like a certain space between them and the next individual or the next group of individuals. It's near uniform, such as these penguins here, uniformly spaced, like they all have a little arms width that they like to be away from the nearest individual. In clump distribution, individuals are closer to one another than they would be by chance alone. It's due to resource distribution limited dispersal availability or asexual reproduction. Clumped is actually the most common distribution pattern. The most common. And often again, if there's a resource, those individuals, that population may clump near the resource, such as how humans clump their populations near water or in cities. 
near uniform distribution, they're more evenly spaced than would be expected by chance. It's found in breeding colonies and with, a, with competition for resources. Uh, may result from direct interactions between individuals and the pop population, territoriality. It's these birds here. If you look down at them, they look near uniform. Looks very neat. Random. Individuals are distributed randomly when environmental resources are uniformly distributed, and proximity to others is near, neither beneficial nor harmful. Age structure. Individuals in a population are frequently grouped as pre-reproductive, reproductive, or post-reproductive. An age structure of a population, the number of individuals in each several age categories. The reproductive base of a population, all individuals who are of reproductive age or younger. The effects of scale and timing. The scale of the area sampled and the timing of a study can influence the observed demographics. For example, seabirds crowd together during the breeding season, but then disperse when it's over. So if you're going to take uh, a sample of numbers during a certain time, you have to realize when it is you're taking the sample. Is it a time when these organisms crowd together or is it when they disperse? Knowing the subjects you're working with is very important. Wildlife managers use demographic information to decide how best to manage population. Ecologists explain population growth in terms of population size, density, distribution, and the number of individuals in the different age categories. Remember those age categories are, are pre-reproductive, reproductive, and post-reproductive. They have methods of estimating population size, such as random sampling and mark and recapture, and the density of the population in the field. For population size, the number of individuals in a population is increased by births and immigration, that's moving into an area, and it's decreased by deaths and emigration or moving out of the population. Here's a picture to show that. Births and immigration coming in, deaths and emigration going out. This is going to affect your population numbers. From zero to exponential growth? Well, apart from immigration and emigration, an interval in which population size remains unchanged with no net increase or decrease in the number of individuals is called zero population growth. We can measure births and deaths in terms of rates per individual or per capita. Again, per individual or per capita. Per capita growth rate, or R, equals the per capita birth rate, B, minus per capita death rate, or D. I see I have a spelling error here. Again, per capita growth rate, or R, equals per capita birth rate, B, minus per capita death rate, D. So growth rate equals births minus deaths, basically. Example, 2,000 mice live in the same cornfield. 1,000 mice are born each month. The birth rate is 0.5 births per mouse per month. 
or 1,000 divided by 2,000. 200 mice die each month. The death rate is 0.1 deaths per mouse per month. 200 divided by 2,000. So therefore R is 0.4 per mouse per month. 0.5 minus 0.1. As long as R remains constant and greater than zero, exponential growth will occur. A population grows exponentially as long as birth rate is greater than death rate. In exponential growth, a population grows by a fixed percentage in successive time intervals. The size of each increase is determined by the current population size. Often when you look at a graph of exponential growth, you'll see a rise that you call a J-curve like this one with the rabbit. We calculate population growth, or G, based on the per capita growth rate and the number of individuals. So population growth rate, or G, equals per capita growth rate, R, times the number of individuals, N. With exponential growth, a plot of population increases against time, produces a J-shaped curve number of new individuals increases each generation, although per capita growth rate stays the same. Here's some graphs that show some exponential growth, at least to some extent. Populations can maintain exponential growth as long as there's no limiting factors. A limiting factor is something that can inhibit population growth, such as uh, disease or lack of resources and food or lack of shelter. In this case, these are some examples of organisms like the Canada geese we talked about earlier that were almost on the brink of extinction at a certain time, generally in the early 1900s. Both are now protected and numbers are rising again because they're protected and we try to uh, maintain small amounts of limiting factors. We see some exponential growth here, especially in the elephant. Population at this time in 19, um, about 1965 or so, we're almost to 8,000. Whooping cranes have had a little more trouble coming back. Um, their numbers here in 2000 were not quite 200 yet. And they'd had some uh, downfalls, as you can see in the graph. But generally, it's still a J-shaped curve showing exponential growth. What is biotic potential? Well, under ideal conditions, such as uh, enough shelter, food, and other essential resources, and no predators and no pathogens, a population's growth rate reaches its biotic potential, like its greatest maxim maximum number possible. Microbes have high biotic potentials, and large-bodied mammals have low biotic potentials, like an elephant. Again, a biotic potential is the maximum possible population growth rate under optimal conditions. Key concepts. A population size and reproductive base influence its rate of growth. That is, uh, how many individuals are able to reproduce to add to the population. As long as the births exceed deaths, the population will grow exponentially, and each generation then will be larger than the preceding one. 
um, po but so populations seldom reach their biotic potential because of too many limiting factors, such as not having the necessary, re necessary resources like food, territory, and there may be disease and such. Many complex interactions take place within and between populations in nature, and it's not always easy to identify all the factors that can restrict population growth. Essential resources like food, mineral ions, refuge from predators, and safe nesting sites are examples of limiting factors for population growth. In any environment, one essential factor will run out first, and then it acts like a break on that population's growth. Supplying the first limiting factors simply substitutes one for another. All natural populations eventually would encounter these limits. Carrying capacity. A given environment can sustain only a certain number of individuals in a population indefinitely. Ultimately, the sustainable supply of resources will determine the population size. So carrying capacity is the maximum number of individuals of a species that an environment can sustain at a given time. In a graph, generally, we put carrying capacity marked in a line like this, going horizontal. Often, if we look at the population growth of a species, you can actually see where carrying capacity is, such as for this fish. This fish population has a little bit of a change over and over again, but generally, if you drew a line, you would be able to find carrying capacity must be somewhere around in here. Whenever the population overshoots it, it comes back down again, but then right away heads back up towards carrying capacity. Those graphs are good examples of logistic growth. It's a pattern that shows how a small population starts growing slowly in size at first, but then starts to grow rapidly. Then it levels off as it nears ca carrying capacity. It usually shows what's called an S-curved graph, as opposed to exponential growth shows a J-curved graph. Again, carrying capacity is the maximum size an environment can support with no degradation to that habitat. It will vary with each habitat and species and varies in changes of resources. Here in these uh, seals, we can see a nice logistic curve and then leveling off at carrying capacity. For these plankton, we see them overshoot carrying capacity a bit and then crash back down a little bit and then level off at carrying capacity. Often in predator-prey interactions, predator and prey populations influence each other, especially if uh, the prey is one of the sole sources of food of the predator. In this graph, this is actual data taken since the 1800s of the uh, relationship between the snowshoe hare and the lynx. When the snowshoe hare has a good year, lynx have a good year and their populations increase because there's more food and there's more resources. In this case, the snowshoe hare really spiked, but when you go above carrying capacity, what the environment can hold, then it crashes back down. Following that, the lynx crash. And so we get this pattern that follows each other very closely over the years. K, which is often used to symbolize K 
carrying capacity then is estimated right about here for the hair and right about here for the length. Again, here are two graphs to review. Exponential growth with a J curve and logistic growth with an S curve, leveling off at carrying capacity. Factors that affect population growth fall into two categories density dependent factors and density independent factors. A density dependent factor is a factor that limits population growth and has a greater effect in dense populations than in less dense ones. Some factors include pathogens and parasites. As populations increase, it's much more likely that within the population there will be pathogens and there will be parasites. These things are dependent on their density. With density independent factors affecting population growth, these are things that the population has no control over, like fires and earthquakes. The population has no influence over something like that, therefore it's called a density independent factor. For density dependent, once again, these factors include competition, food, mates, nesting sites, predators, parasites, and pathogens. These things are dependent on the density of that population, therefore are called density dependent factors. Density independent factors include things that are abiotic or non-living factors, like sunlight and amount of energy, temperature, rainfall, climate, earthquakes, etc. Organisms like that have no, um, no control on factors such as that. For example, in 1944, 29 reindeer were introduced to St. Matthew Island. 1957, there were 1,350 well-fed reindeer munching on lichens there. In 1963, however, there were 6,000 hungry reindeer. They had exceeded their carrying capacity. In 1966, wow, 42 live reindeer and many, many bleached bones. There was an absolute crash in population down to only 42 left. In the 1980s, there was no reindeer. This is an example of overshoot and crash. So for key concepts again, limits on increases in size, density dependent factors like competition for resources lead to logistic growth. A population grows exponentially at first, then growth slows as the number approaches the environment's carrying capacity. Life history patterns. Reproduction-related events that occur between birth and death make up what's called a life history pattern. A life history pattern is a set of traits related to growth, survival and reproduction, such as lifespan, age-specific mortality, and age at first reproduction, and the number of breeding events. This is a life history pattern. We study life history traits within a population by recording what happens to a specific cohort. A cohort is a group of individuals born during the same interval. Human life expectancy tables are usually based on information about current conditions rather than a real cohort. Patterns, information about age-specific death rates can also be summarized by a survivorship curve which shows how many members of a cohort remain alive over time. There's three types of survivorship curves that are common. 
A survivorship curve is a graph that shows the decline in numbers of a cohort over time. So here are our three types of survivorship curves. These are generalized strategies. So type 1, it's like a human. At the beginning, if you take a look at the graph, this is survival per thousand on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is the percent of maximum lifespan. So at the very beginning, survival is very high your chances of dying are not very great until you start to get older. Then death rate increases in these post-reproductive years. Again, a human is a great example of a type 1 survivorship curve. Chances of staying alive young are good but decrease when you get post-reproductive state. Some organisms, like type 2 organisms like hydra, it's an animal that likes to live in freshwater ponds, lakes, and streams, um, the pattern is that no matter what age you are, your chances of dying are quite constant at constant rate throughout life. Again, that's a type 2. A type 3 survivorship curve, actually in the beginning, in pre-reproductive ages, your chances of dying are actually quite great until you get to a certain age. And it's much more likely than you'll survive in the post-reproductive years. Elephants have a type 1 survivorship as well, with low mortality until old age. This is typical of large animals that bear one or a few offspring at a time and provide extended parental care. For type 2, snowy egrets are a good example. They have a fairly constant death rate throughout life. This is typical of lizards, small mammals, and large birds. Type 3 survivorship curve, sea urchins are a great example. Mortality is high for the larva, and in old age, but low in adults. It's typical of species that produce many small offspring and provide little or no parental care. For demography, this is a great example of a life table using building ground squirrel. Let's look at the life table a bit. Here we have our cohorts, which are our ages. We have the number alive at the start of each cohort. So you can follow this through. This is the female side that we started with 337. But as these individuals got to each cohort, less and less were surviving until 9 to 10 years, we only have one left. This is the proportion alive at the start of the year. This is the number of deaths during the year. This is the death rate and the average life expectancy once you're at each cohort age. If I move that out of the way, you can see that males don't go down as far with their age and years. They don't live as long as females. We're looking at four to six years only compared with females ten years. One might ask why that is. Many reasons, mainly because the males take more risks, are more aggressive, 
it may one lead you to uh, wonder why uh, teenage boys pay high car insurance rates when we look at life tables like this and it may also appear similar in humans boys and males are more aggressive and therefore their life table may be different than what females are here's a graph that plots their life tables the relatively straight lines of the plots indicate a relatively constant rate of death however males have a lower survival rate overall than females do allocated reproductive investment natural selection influences the timing of reproduction and how much a parent invests in each offspring the most adaptive reproductive strategy is that which maximizes a parent's lifetime reproductive success. Reproduction involves trade-offs between offspring quality and quantity. The most effective reproductive strategy can vary with population density. For instance, um, kestrel falcons. The cost of larger broods to both male and female parents was a topic of study by population ecologists. They did an experiment in which they gave the kestrels a reduced brood size. A brood is the number of eggs that become chicks. And here we see when they had a reduced brood size that survival was actually better when they had their normal brood size here it is at about 60 percent for females a little less for males when they gave them a larger brood size and and forced them to take care of more babies survival was quite a bit lower their conclusion was the lower survival rates of kestrels with larger broods indicate that caring for more offspring negatively affects the survival of the parents. Therefore, kestrels have kind of a, an average brood size instead of one that's too large or too small. reproductive strategies we find about two main patterns then when we think about trade-offs with the number of and size of offspring versus the survival of the parent we have a strategy called case selected strategy this is one that humans fall under where we have late reproduction meaning we don't reproduce for quite a few years after we're born we have few offspring and with the few we do have we invest a lot of time in raising those offspring and typically there's a lot of maternal care there primates are another example and even the coconut is an example like this coconut uh, palm here they produce a moderate number of very large seeds the large endosperm provides nutrients for the embryo, an adaptation that helps ensure the success of a relatively large fraction of offspring. The R-selected pattern, organisms reproduce quite early. They don't get as long of a childhood. They have many offspring, and they don't really care for their, their offspring very much. Insects are a great example, and many plants are as well, like these dandelions. They grow quickly and produce a large number of seeds, ensuring that at least some will grow into plants and eventually produce seeds themselves. And this praying mantis here, having many, many eggs that turn into children, but in the long run, not all of them will survive, but the strategy 
is to have a lot of offspring and relatively quickly in life. But again, it's about the trade-offs with the number and size of the offspring versus the survival of the parents and the offspring. With our selection, the individuals who produce a maximum number of offspring as quickly as possible have a selective advantage, and it occurs when population density is low and resources are abundant. With case selection, individuals who produce offspring that outcompete others for limited resources have a selective advantage. This occurs when a population is near carrying capacity. patterns of survival and reproduction, the life history traits such as age at first reproduction and number of offspring per reproductive event vary and are shaped by natural selection. The adaptive life history traits are those that maximize an individual's lifetime reproductive success. Here's a good example of K and R species. K species having a nice logistic curve with slow growth up to carrying capacity. R species doing the boomer bust, overshooting carrying capacity and crashing down to slightly below it. It's evidence of evolving life history patterns. Organisms continually adapt to environmental changes as when shifts in predation pressure alter life history traits. For example, a long-term study by evolutionary biologists illustrates that the effect of predation on uh, guppy life history traits. Several populations of guppies live in a stream with many small waterfalls that serve as natural barriers. And different guppy populations face different predation pressures. Some populations live with killfish, a relatively small predator that eats the immature guppies. Other populations live with cichlids, which are larger and tend to eat the mature guppies. The guppies hunted by the cichlids grow faster. They're smaller at maturity, they reproduce earlier, and have more offspring at a time. And they breed more frequently than the guppies hunted by killfish. Researchers found that these differences in life history traits are genetic. The predators acted as selective agents that influenced the guppy life history patterns. Compared to guppies raised with killifish, guppies raised with cichlids differed in size and length and the time between their broods. The effect of overfishing on Atlantic cod. In response to fishing pressure on larger fish, Atlantic codfish began maturing faster and reproducing younger. In 1992, a ban on cod fishing came too late to stop the Atlantic cod population from crashing. Life history changes were early signs of overfishing. Had biologists recognized the signs, they might have been able to save the fishery in more than 35,000 jobs. Human population growth. Here we are. This is about us. For most of history, the human population grew very slowly. In 2009, human population size surpassed 6.8 billion. And in about 2011, on about Halloween of that year, we reached 7 billion. The growth rate began to increase about 10,000 years ago and then it soared during the past two centuries. Three trends promoted the large increases. Number one, humans were able to migrate into new habitats and expand into new climate zones. Humans developed new technologies that increased the carrying capacity of our existing habitats. Nothing like increasing your own carrying capacity. Um, Number three, humans sidestep some limiting factors that usually restrain the growth of other species, our big brains and our technology coming into play there. Almost 
like we can outwit nature. Here's a nice graph showing human population growth. Again, very slow. This is an interesting spot here where uh, population dipped a bit because of the Black Death in Europe. The Industrial Revolution hit. Significant medical technology hit. And bam, we have this huge exponential growth here. A beautiful J-shaped curve. A great example of exponential growth. Key innovations, human skills that override normal population limits. We've learned to start fires, build shelters, make clothing, cooperate in hunts, manufacture tools, our language and our knowledge that we pass to generation after generation, our agriculture to feed and have a, a more dependable food supply, improve sanitation, medical advances, vaccines, antibiotics, energy from fossil fuels allowed development of mechanized agriculture to sustain even a larger population yet. These are our key innovations that have led to our population growth as it is. The fertility rates, the quality of life is inversely related to population growth, resource depletion, and pollution. Many governments now offer family planning programs to reduce fertility rates. Worldwide, total fertility rate has fallen from 6.5 in 1950 to 2.6 in 2008, and repl replacement fertility rate for developed countries is 2.1. Again, the total fertility rate is the average number of children the women of a population bear over the course of a lifetime. The replacement fertility rate is the average number of children women of a population must bear to replace themselves with a daughter of reproductive age. The world population is expected to reach 8.9 billion by 2050 and possibly to decline as the century ends. China and India each hold more than 1 billion people. Together, 38% of the world population. The United States is third with 307 million. We seem to have an uneven distribution of population with 90% of births in developing countries. Makes scientists and population ecologists wonder what is K or carrying capacity for humans. Some population ecologists estimate 10 to 15 billion. Some estimate more and some estimate less. It's a question we haven't been able to answer yet. Though 90% of births are in developing countries, our wealth is undistributed, or not very evenly distributed, I should say. The wealthiest 20% consumes about 90% of the resources, which increases the gap between the rich and the poor. There are choices as to which future path the world should take. Age structure diagrams. An age structure diagram shows the distribution of individuals among age groups. The broader the base of an age structure, the greater proportion of young people, therefore more people who are able to reproduce, and therefore a graded expected growth. More than one third of the world population is in the broad pre-reproductive base. The world population growth can't be slowed for many years 
because 1.9 billion people are about to enter reproductive age. Here's some pictures of age structure. This one shows rapid growth, slow growth, such as the United States, and zero growth. So what you want to do is look at the base and see how many people are going to be entering reproductive age, and uh, above the base, how many people are currently in the reproductive ages. If your base is large, you're going to be having more babies and more individuals added to your population. Like um, rapid growth in Kenya here. The most highly developed countries have the lowest birth rates and infant mortality and the highest life expectancy. High population growth is correlated with low levels of economic development and low per capita consumption of resources. Negative population growth in some countries also poses challenges. The demographic transition model describes how changes in population growth often unfold in four stages of economic development. The dem demographic transition model is a model that describes the changes in human birth and death rates that occur as a region becomes industrialized. Stage 1, pre-industrial. Before widespread technological and medical advances, birth and death rates are both high and growth rate is low. Stage 2 is transitional. The industrialization begins. Food production and health care improve. Death rate drops fast, but birth rate declines more slowly. Population growth rate increases rapidly. For example, Mexico. Stage 3 is industrialized, fully industrialized. People move from the country to the cities where birth control is available, and couples want smaller families. Birth rate declines to closer to death rate, and the population grows less rapidly. For example, the United States. In Stage 4, it's post-industrial, the population's growth rate becomes negative. Birth rate falls below the death rate, and the population decreases. This is like Japan. Some countries in Europe, some members of the former Soviet Union and Japan currently have negative population growth. Birth rate is lower than the death, death rate. The negative growth produces a population with more old people than young, which can become a problem because older individuals have traditionally been supported by a larger, younger workforce. Development and consumption. On a per capita basis, people in highly developed countries use far more resources than those in less developed countries, therefore generating more waste and more pollution. The ecological footprint, the area of Earth's surface required to sustainably support a particular level of development and consumption. People in China and India consume less than average. Per capita footprint of the U.S. is more than three times the average, though. We would say we have a large ecological footprint. Is it overpopulation or overconsumption? I would say overconsumption. We have slow growth of population in the U.S., yet we use a lot of resources. Billions of people in India, China, and other less developed nations aspire to live like Americans. For everyone to live like an average American, four times the sustainable resources available on Earth would be required. The human population may already be living beyond its ecological means or above Earth's carrying capacity. 
the human population. Human populations have sidestepped historical limits to growth by way of global expansion into new habitats, cultural traits, and technological innovations. But no population can expand indefinitely, and we're starting to push our limits. We wonder what will happen to our population. What will the growth look like? Will there be a crash in population, such as some of these graphs show, such as like the reindeer we talked about earlier? It seems that in, in many cases, population growth goes over the carrying capacity and then crashes back down either slightly or dramatically like this one. What happens to other populations of animals in the wild could definitely happen to human population as well. Here are some other graphs that I've included that are interesting. So you should be able to recognize logistic and exponential growth where needed. I like graphs. Here's one that shows the relationship once again between predator and prey. When one does well, the other does well, and when one crashes, the other tends to crash. Same thing here with these rabbits and coyotes. I like this graph because it labels a lot of things that happen along the way with our exponential growth to 7 billion. Which of these will represent the human population in the future? Hard to say. Population ecologists are still trying to answer this. These are some interesting graphs concerning China. Just like the United States had uh, its innovations labeled, so does China here. This was an interesting diagram that can bring up some good discussion. And this was an interesting cartoon I found about population growth and resources trying to hold us up. Back to the honking mess. Revisited. Samples of tissue found in the engines of the plane that landed in the Hudson were sent to the Smithsonian Institute for DNA Analysis. The unique sequences in the DNA identified the tissue in both engines as Canada Goose. The isotope mix in the feather bits indicated the birds were migratory from a Canadian population. 